Dr. Sage here. Today we begin our lectures learning about plants. Plants are actually going to cover two separate chapters. In the first chapter, we're going to talk about the seedless plants. And in the second chapter, we're going to talk about the seed plants. So to begin, let's have an introduction to plants themselves. So we're going to talk about what we classify as land plants, which are eukaryotes and in the kingdom planta. Uh, the ancestors to the land plants were the green algae. The evolutionary transition from water to land imposed several constraints on land plants. They had to develop strategies to avoid drying out. They had to get structural support to overcome gravity because they didn't have the water buoyancy holding them up anymore. They had to be able to capture sunlight energy and they had to disperse their reproductive cells. Seed plants then developed, allowing them to populate even the most dry environments, while most seedless plants require a moist environment. Okay, if you recall back in the lectures on the protus, we learned about this group, the Archiplastidia, and then we talked about the algae, uh, and we talked about how the green algae, in particular the carophytes, are the closest living relatives of the land plants. Okay, and today we're going to talk about the land plants, whereas we talked about the algae in the protus chapters. Okay, so if we put these two together, the carophytes, which is a type of green algae in the land plants, that's in a group called the streptophytes. Okay, that includes the carophytes and the embryophytes, which is the land plants. Now the land plants can be further subdivided into non-vascular plants, they don't have a vascular system to transport water, for example, throughout the plants, and a vascular system, so the vascular plants. The non-vascular plants are seedless plants called bryophytes, and then there are types of bryophytes called liverworts, hornworts, and mosses. We'll talk about them in this first chapter. And then you have the vascular seedless plants, okay, which we'll also talk about in this chapter. Then you have the vascular seed plants, which is the next chapter. So recall from an earlier course that haploid means one of each type of chromosome, diploid means two of each type of chromosome. The haplonic refers to life cycles in which there is a dominant haploid stage, whereas diplonic refers to life cycles in which diploid is the dominant stage. So for example, humans are diploid. The only part of the human or mammal life cycle that is haploid is the gametes. Everything else is diploid. Okay, so that's diplonic because diploid is the dominant stage. Now, most plants exhibit what's called alternation of generations, which is very different. In other words, in plants, one generation is haploid. The next, their kids are diploid. The next generation, their grandkids are haploid. Next generation, great-grandkids are diploid again. So it alternates generations, going from diploid, haploid, diploid, haploid, diploid, haploid. Okay, the haploid generation is called the gametophyte generation. The diploid generation is called the sporophyte generation. The gametophyte generation is the dominant generation in the lower plants. Okay, and we'll go through that. As plants evolved, the gametophyte generation got smaller and the sporophyte generation became more dominant. Okay, and again, we'll discuss that. But first, the basic concept of alternation of generations. One generation, the gametophyte, is haploid, one of each type of chromosome. Their kids, the next generation, is the sporophyte generation, that's called, that's the diploid generation, two of each type of chromosome. Then the sporophyte will make the next generation, which will go back to the haploid, the gametophyte. The gametophyte will then make the next generation, the sporophyte, go back to diploid. So it alternates diploid, haploid, diploid, haploid. Now, something that is very different from what you learned back in Bio 1, you learned about the process of mitosis and meiosis. Now, when you learned meiosis, you learned that was to make the gametes, the sperm cell and the egg cell, which is true for humans, for mammals, okay? But that's not true for plants, okay? For plants, the gametophyte generation is the generation that makes the gametes, that makes the sperm and the egg. Now, remember, the gametophyte is haploid. They have one of each type of chromosome. So they can't do meiosis to make gametes because during meiosis, you cut the chromosome number in half. You can't cut it in half if you already only have one of each type of chromosome. 
So the gametophytes do mitosis to make gametes, to make the sperm and the egg. Okay, then the gametes fuse together to make the zygote, and then the zygotes develop through the process of mitosis to make the sporophyte, the diploid generation. Now the sporophyte that's diploid is going to do meiosis, but it's not gonna do meiosis to make gametes. It's gonna do meiosis to make spores, which are not gametes. Those spores grow up through the process of mitosis into the next generation, the gametophyte generation. Okay, so it will take a little getting used to the fact that you're not using meiosis to make gametes. You're using meiosis to make spores. You're using mitosis to make gametes. Something else that's a drive trait of the land plant is the apical meristems. Okay, so in plants, the roots need to be able to grow longer and the shoots need to, be able to grow longer, grow taller. How does that happen? Well, near the tips of the roots and tips of the shoots of plants, there's this region called the apical meristem. That region is basically constantly undergoing mitosis to make new cells. Okay, and that's how you get new cells to grow longer to help this root tip grow longer. Now, early land plants did not grow more than a few inches off the ground. Why? Because they were non-vascular. They couldn't transport water throughout their system through a vascular system. By developing shoots and growing taller, individual plants were able to capture more sunlight. So there was an advantage. They could get more sunlight energy, be able to do more photosynthesis, make more food. It was better for the plant. Land plants then incorporated more rigid molecules in their stems to support them to be able to grow taller. And then they had to develop vascular tissues because as they were farther from the ground, they had to be able to transport water throughout that taller body. The vascular tissues were developed for transport of water and food derived from photosynthesis, allowing plants to grow taller away from the water source. Xylem conducts water and minerals from soil up to the shoot. Phloem transports products of photosynthesis through the entire plant. Okay, so this is the types of vascular tissues, xylem and phloem, but we're actually gonna talk about them in more details later. Another dry characteristic of land plant is they had to develop a waxy cuticle protect the leaves and stem from desiccation. Was, they don't want to lose too much water. They need to keep the water in the plants. However, this waxy cuticle also prevented the plants from being able to take in carbon dioxide. So to solve that problem, these, these little openings called stoma or stomata, that allow gas exchange, carbon dioxide in and oxygen out. They also develop protective flavonoids and other pigments, which are developed to help protect them from UVB rays. Land plants could also develop poisonous secondary metabolites, such as alkaloids, that could be used to deter predators. In other words, there are things that like to eat plants. Well, a plant might not want to be eaten. Okay, they develop this basically poison, so they're less likely to be eaten. In contrast, some plants co-evolve with animals by developing sweet and nutritious metabolites for animals to aid in pollination and dispersing pollen grades and seeds. Okay, recall as I said, the streptophytes are the carophytes plus the land plants. So the land plants are closely related to green algae, the carophytes, and are part of a monophyletic group called streptophyta. Both the carophytes and the land plants contain carotenoids and chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. They both store carbohydrates as starch. The remaining green algae belong to a group called chlorophyta. This is an example of the closest living relative of land plants. It's a noxious weed in Florida where it clogs their waterways. And this is a type of carophyte, okay, a type of green algae. So that was your brief introduction to plants. In the next video lecture, we're gonna discuss in details the non-vascular seedless plants. And then in the lecture after that, we're gonna talk about the vascular seedless plants. And then in the next set of video lectures, which will be the next chapter, we're going to discuss the seed plants. So until next time, this has been Dr. Sage.